These are also very controversial. We are very pleased to have with us um, a special guest, Dr. Mariam Halimzadeh. Uh, she is an associate professor in history and politics of Iran at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies and a Middle uh, East Center Fellow. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. Uh, currently, she is working, she's writing a book titled Iran's Revolutionary Guards, a History. The book is in, in progress and in, is in, based on uh, first-hand research on the Revolutionary Guards, first generation of commanders, volunteers, supporters, and critiques as they struggle to find order in chaos uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Dr. Alim Zadi, research interests uh, include revolutions, state building, militias, and militaries, and modern Iran, and how to study these phenomena by looking at the individual people and actions that create them bit by bit. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Alim Zadi. Thank you so much. Should I turn this yes, off? Yes, please. OK. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, Dr. Al-Basri. This is a great pleasure to be here and um, to share some of my research and policy analysis with everyone. So, um, as you very well know, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, known as the IRGC, has led extraterritorial armed activities in the Middle East for a long time now. And it's mainly targeted U.S. forces and their allies in the region. The IRGC is also the main organization that enables um, Iran's support for what we know as Iran proxies in the region, such as the hot in the news Hamas and um, the Houthis. Uh, but more substantially so, the Lebanese Hezbollah and the Iraqi Hashd al-Shabi. Mainly as a result of such activities, um, which have been defined partially or fully as terrorist acts by the United States and sometimes by um, international organizations like the UN uh, Security Council, the IRGC has been the target of many sanctions. Uh, and that is on top of the general sanctions against Iran that have been imposed mainly by the US, but also uh, by the larger international community. And these sanctions have significantly increased uh, since 2019. As we speak today, the sanctions have barely altered the trajectory of the IRGC's extraterritorial activities, but especially the Quds Force activities. They have nevertheless continued to remain in place, and there's actually a variety of petitions and motions and demonstrations from various parties and from grassroots uh, organizations that demand their continuation or a, a actually reinforcement. So today I'd like to talk about this apparent discrepancy. Why have sanctions failed on this front, and why do they persist as a desirable policy? So to give you a quick outline, I will first paint a picture of uh, the role of the IRGC in Iran and what sanctions have been imposed on Iran and the IRGC, and uh, what have these sanctions meant so far. Then to answer the question of why sanctions have failed, which I believe is um, there's an argument to make for, uh, I'll talk about the IRGC's institutional history. I believe there lies the answer. Uh, how it has internalized flexibility and informality as a sort of modus operandi, so to speak. And how its extraterritorial activities actually are a continu continuation of exactly that um, uh, mode of operation. And it has allowed it to fly under radars, avoid sanctions um, to a good degree in this particular area. And finally, I'll discuss why sanctions have remained in place and um, politically popular despite uh, this like, uh, um, relative uh, ineffectiveness. One reason that a lot of uh, analysts uh, acknowledge is that they have a symbolic value in the global north uh, for, for the domestic audience in the global north. 
But another reason that I want to put forward is that they've had an indirect effect uh, driving Iran's general foreign policy, not extraterritorial armed activities in the Middle East, but general foreign policy and nuclear ambitions into a more desirable direction, desirable for the global north. I'll um, talk uh, more on this below. So in 2015, uh, again, you uh, probably uh, very well know about this, but the Western powers signed an accord with Iran, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, also known as the Iran Nuclear Deal, which was designed to curtail Iran's nuclear activity in exchange for some economic relief. The implementation of uh, the JCPOA from 2015 to 2018 provided temporary relief as most of the sanctions related to Iran's nuclear program were lifted. But in May 2018, President Trump unilaterally exited um, the plan, and um, therefore the JCPOA did not have any long-lasting results in, on Iran's economy. Even though the EU powers remain committed, um, because the US had reinstated uh, the sanctions, it made um, uh, trade with the rest of the international community basically very limited, or if not impossible, as well. And in 2019, the Trump administration took a further step, which I uh, also want to talk about, and added Iran's powerful military security conglomerate, the IRGC, um, to the U.S. foreign terrorist organizations list, the FTO, um, which would then trigger a wider range or like harsher punishments uh, uh, for um, uh, violating the sanctions. So. Um, to just like understand a little bit more what sanctions against the IRGC mean, the IRGC today is, an, is not just a military, it's an expansive security, policing, uh, economic, finance, um, like cultural production conglomerate that is, um, like it is argued that it's a, even a parallel state, uh, no, not even a shadow state. Um, it has quite some influence on the Iranian um, uh, politics, both domestic and international. So, so when it comes to international transactions, it's really hard to separate the IRGC from Iran at large. It's hard to find a state-related company that has no ties to the IRGC. It's quite hard to have diplomatic arrangements that does not include the IRGC. Even when it comes to Iranian citizens, uh, it's hard to draw the line who's had a transaction with the IRGC and who has not. Because, for instance, if you own a mobile line in Iran, it means you've probably at some point have had a financial transaction with the IRGC because they used to, or maybe they still do, own uh, telecommunication companies. Um, if you paid for online entertainment services, like uh, stream at home um, uh, entertainment services, or uh, I think I have some pictures here, yeah, or have uh, like gone to one of these like fancy new shopping malls in Tehran means you've been an IRGC customer. A lot of them, a lot of the investments are um, made by IRGC uh, economic bases. Let alone the mandatory service and conscription. Almost all male citizens in Iran have to go to um, um, service, report for service, and more than half of them are sent to serve in the IRGC as opposed to Iran's regular army, and that is like they have no choice in that. But most related to the topic of our discussion is the IRGC's Quds Force, of course, the extraterritorial branch, uh, which conducts asymmetric warfare throughout the Middle East and sometimes even beyond the region. As such, the Quds Force pursues Iranian regional interests, uh, mostly as defined by hardliners, I should add, um, through any possible means, including those ascribed by the US as acts of terrorism. So the FTO designation, the Foreign Terrorist Organization uh, list, listing of the IRGC in 2019, was mainly directed to, or intended to restrict the Quds Force um, uh, in the Middle East and its activities against US forces. In order to assess how effective this particular round of limitations was, we need to look back at the history of international sanctions against Iran and the IRGC, because the 2019 designation was by no means America's um, first step towards this goal. So since 1996, Iran was proscribed as a state sponsor of terrorism by the United States alongside Libya and put under extensive economic sanctions as a result. This is Iran at large, not the IRGC. The 1996 uh, act known as the Iran-Libya Act responded to both Iran's nuclear ambitions, 
but also to its supportive organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, which the U.S. already considered terrorists much uh, before uh, the IRGC. The act has been renewed several times since then. It's still in place uh, by successive U.S. administrations. In 2007, the IRGC's Quds Force, many uh, of IRGC business operations, and a host of individuals associated with the IRGC were specifically sanctioned by the United States for involvement in either nuclear and ballistic missile programs or in activities supporting uh, terrorist organizations outside of Iran. So in addition to Iran being called a state sponsor of terrorism, the IRGC becomes uh, sanctioned as sort of a operational wing of uh, the support. These rounds of sanctions impose economic limitations on entities doing business in Iran, uh, with Iran in general, and the IRGC and its particular, uh, like designated members uh, uh, in particular. And that uh, it um, um, specified that if the transaction knowingly assisted the country's alleged terrorist activities, it should be um, limited under these sanctions. So we have the 1996 Act on the one hand, and the sanctions following the IRGC's partial, as in 2007, um, uh, and then wholesale in 2019 terrorist designation on the other. Having in mind that Iran and the IRGC are pretty much one and the same these days, the main difference between the general US sanctions against Iran and uh, the um, terrorism-related sanctions against the IRGC is this. Conducting business with the IRGC would be considered criminal according to the latter part of the sanctions. So the terrorism-related sanctions added this layer of um, 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 like uh, punishment, this, this punitive layer, which enabled the US government to prosecute those uh, conducting internationally, in, sorry, intentionally harmful transactions with the IRGC, which is a major business agent in Iran. So before that, if um, uh, like somebody violated the sanctions, what would happen like to the um, uh, US entity, to like the European, Chinese, whoever uh, obliges by the US sanctions, um, they would lose some uh, financial privileges. They wouldn't be able to apply for um, like government-supported loans. They wouldn't be uh, able to conduct some types of businesses. But with the terrorist designations, partial in 2007 and then in 2019, what uh, happened was that a, um, they were basically, such transactions would be criminal, uh, pursuable in court. So um, uh, like a, um, deterrent factor added. But did either of these rounds of terrorism-related sanction, uh, terrorism sanctions achieve the stated goal of curbing the IRGC's um, extraterritorial activities? I think the answer is a relative no. Because the terrorist label provided a stronger deterrent factor, correct, but it did not change the mechanism for pressuring Iran. All sanctions prohibited conducting business with Iranian uh, state-related entities, uh, but did not have the means to monitor potential extra-legal transactions. Um, so like the general wave of sanctions and the tightened criminalization, uh, criminalization um, um, of 2007, um, the 2019 listing did not effectively restrain IRGC's activities in the region against US forces. The, there are some evidence uh, around this. Um, I forgot to put the code on the slide, sorry. But there was an um, open letter that Republican senators sent to President Biden um, in April of 2022, when and, like, the latest round of negotiations between Iran and major Western powers was ongoing about uh, like reviving the JCPOA. The Republican senators warned President Biden of the danger of potentially removing the IRGC from the FTO because it had become the major uh, point of debate in those round of uh, discussions. And they pointed out that since the designation, the IRGC, quote, has shown no meaningful change in conduct, end quote. There is some evidence that the IRGC's influence outside of Iran, particularly in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, has marginally subsided uh, after 2019. But in the lack of conclusive evidence, it is difficult to say whether the change is caused by the decades-old sanctions or by the 2020 assassination of General Soleimani uh, in Iraq, 
um, uh, which was uh, critically instrumental uh, as a commander in uh, God's force. So the marginal demise might be attributed um, to his elimination. Therefore, I think it's safe to say that in terms of extraterritorial armed activity, the IRGC has proved relatively immune to the added layers of sanctions that followed the FTO listing in 2019. So the question to address is this, why sanctions have failed on this particular front? And uh, later I will address why they continue as um, a politically popular tactic against the IRGC. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, closer? Okay. So for an answer to why sanctions have failed, I think it's worthwhile to look at the IRGC's institutional history, how it became the major power that it is today, and what structure did it like grow into. The IRGC started, like many other revolutionary institutions, relying on impromptu informal setups, local resources, and personal relationships of uh, trust. In the first year, year and a half before, uh, after the 1979 revolution, there was not much support, not much, not much political support, because Tehran was still chaotic itself, uh, like different factions were uh, fighting to consolidate power. Um, so uh, Ayatollah Khomeini and his um, uh, like close confidants, they still didn't did not have the final uh, grip on power. You all know there was a like a uh, provisional um, or like interim government in place that did not uh, endorse the radical views of uh, uh, more um, later known as Islamist clerics. So there the. the the, the sort of uh, assertion that the IRGC enjoyed political support from the get-go is kind of a myth when you look at the early history more closely. So it was more the quote-unquote revolutionary resources that it relied on in the first uh, year. But whereas most revolutionary institutions grow closer to an ideal typical rational bureaucracy as time passes, the IRGC uh, this is what I find in my um, uh, main body of research. Um, it preserved some of its reliance on informal and spontaneous action that is like that comes with revolutionary times. The fact that it participated in the repression of resilient ethnic uh, uh, uprisings weeks after its formation and its contribution to the government's relative success of the violent crackdown consolidated the informality and spontane spontaneity as an acceptable mode of operation. So there was less pressure on them to professionalize, to just like uh, bureaucratize um, into a routine organization. And the same flexibility was further validated when Iraq invaded Iran in September of 1980. Amidst the political turmoil in Tehran and the Iranian army's limited capacity because of purges and desertions that happened with the revolution, um, the IRGC's limited and high casualty operations were embraced as a step forward politically. Um, these limited operations relied exactly on the assets that a, again, quote unquote, revolutionary organization can afford. Basic skills, improvisation to deploy unconventional methods and resources, and high motivation of volunteers and a large number of them. So if I may take a quick detour to um, like give you a glimpse of uh, the book I'm working on. Um, I. This is actually an article um, um, related to the book. But I show f through the interviews that I did with the first generation of war veterans and IRGC um, founders that um, first th th basic military skills started to emerge on an individual level. I have interviews, for instance, from a veteran uh, with a pseudonym Wafi, where he says, where he was um, not trained militarily, he was serving in Khorasan, uh, um, east of Iran, on the borders. When the war started, he jumped on a train himself, no like organization, no actual recruitment. He went there on his own initiative. And upon arrival in Ahwaz, when the um, um, uh, like um, capital of Khuzestan, where the war was happening, 
Um, he was appointed as uh, his province, uh, his province's um, um, like kind of reconnaissance unit director, and he uh, remembers. Uh, in an archived interview that uh, in the province forces station, there was a small room with an old door, a small rug on the floor, a partial map of Khuzestan on the wall. There was nothing, nothing else there, not even shelves, not even a phone, not, uh, or a wireless communication system uh, to work with. Then he also remembers that based on this, um, uh, this type of resources, and his, um, Education, he takes pride that he had a high school diploma. A lot of the volunteers then didn't even have that. So based on a high school diploma, based on uh, his knowledge of warfare, which comes from books like Sun Tzu's, uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War, so very generic like readings that he has just like picked up and read, uh, plus a Toyota motorbike that he had like acquired from uh, like friends and the personal network that he had. He established this reconnaissance unit, Operation Reconnaissance Unit. He would b basically jump on the motorbike with someone else, just go to uh, as close as possible to Iraqi lines, collect whatever kind of information, and um, um, bring them back. So I see a lot of such examples of uh, like individual initiatives and like basic skills developed that don't need a lot of uh, training, professionalization, or resources. Over time, these grow into, just like accumulate into uh, resources that the army, the Iranian regular army, then starts to take seriously. Um, the photo is of General Sayyad Shirazi, the army uh, commander at the time, and Hassan Baghari, who had become um, the IRGC's reconnaissance unit uh, commander at the time. So he basically put together this unit. He gathered information from these uh, like individuals on the motorbikes, um, trained them to write daily reports, and collected them and delivered them to the army. So at the end of a very small operation, before the major operations that um, took back Iranian land, um, one of the army officers remembers this. He says, in the first meeting we had with the Guard Brothers uh, about this mini operation, they presented their operation plan. Since it was devised based on their personal creativity and regardless of classical military models, it attracted attention. Therefore, after it was complemented by the division, the Army Division's limited defensive plan uh, devised later, it was transmitted to operating units. With regard to the appended reconnaissance assessment, it seemed that the IRGC people in charge of it had studied some of the Army general staff document models and presented the report in the Army's concise format. So they started to just like learn by doing and um, like put together these basic military skills and develop them. What I also argue in my work is that in the later years of the war and beyond, the IRGC then managed to preserve some of this um, sort of um, basic level of professionalism, like liminal space between no training and skills at all and a professional military keep some of the flexibility that comes with it and um, un under the label of revolutionary because like spontaneity and revolutionariness uh, go along. And uh, you can still see traces of it in their behavior today. So just a, a quick note is that, that in uh, be between 1988 World War and that until 2000, um, uh, the end of Raf Sanjani's, uh, towards the end of Raf Sanjani's um, um, uh, presidential term, it went through structural changes. I'm not claiming that nothing happened to the IRGC of the early wars afterwards. Uh, it expanded in terms of security and policing. There, uh, as Ali Ansari puts it, a mercantilization happened. IRGC stepped into financial and uh, like infrastructural businesses. Um, but uh, while still uh, preserving some of this ingrained uh, revolutionary characteristics. Um, it was a long detour, I apologize. What's important, I think, what this research um, like, um, can show us is that we can detect the same uh, traces of the early IRGC within the Quds Force. Because the Quds Force is not equipping Iran's state and non-state allies with 
billion dollar aid packages as, for instance, the U.S. is sending to Ukraine or Israel. Um, nor is it selling them high-tech aerial or ground fair equipment. Rather, it exports its expertise in asymmetric warfare to Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Palestine, and uh, most recently Russia, as we know, um, among other places. So what the IRGC exports is uh, drones and ballistic missile parts, as well as uh, the technology related to it, in addition to military advice of commanders who have learned to fight flexibly and undercover in the early years of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, engineering skills that equip rebels with handmade explosives, IEDs, etc., and low-skill combatants recruited through the IRGC's expansive network, uh, whether as volunteers or in return for meager sums of money. So formal monitoring mechanisms that san the sanctions apply um, apply to are not um, the vessel for carrying these activities, neither of them. Over the years, the IRGC has become the expert in operating in a limited area of expertise, which is uh, what you see in this list. And uh, it's remained a largely undetectable force as a result. And it continues to operate as such outside of Iran especially. Even the most conspicuous and military, militarily advanced uh, aid exported from Iran, drones and ballistic missiles, are not an exception to this trend, as um, in they have not been stopped by sanctions. Iranian drones are flying over foreign skies from Ukraine to the Red Sea, and missile attacks against U.S. allies in the Middle East have only increased uh, according to some data. So we get to the second question. Why and how have counterterrorism sanctions continued as a strategy, and um, why have they um, remained popular both within, uh, say, Iranian diaspora and some um, like conservative countries in the global north? So following his campaign promises, President Biden strived to reinstate the JCPOA uh, by rekindling the nuclear talks with Iran, which uh, he did. Uh, but after more than a year or of working on an agreeable new draft, in, in May of 2022, the discussions came down to the unnegotiable issue of the IRGC's FTO designation. Iran insisted on the IRGC's delisting, and the Biden administration was adamant that it wasn't something they were willing to do. The administration was under pressure, the Biden administration, both from... Um, 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 domestic audience, both Republican and um, um, Democrat, uh, but also by its regional allies, especially uh, Israel. As I mentioned, analysts have uh, um, acknowledged that um, there is a symbolic value in um, keeping the IRGC on the terrorist uh, list, foreign terrorist organizations list, Removing them with no ch apparent change happening would send the wrong signal to uh, everyone. Um, so it's served as a political tool to respond to domestic and international demands that the U.S. takes action against the organization and does not take it lightly. But uh, what I want to argue in addition to this is that Although these sanctions have been rather ineffectual in the, like the IRGC's Middle East activities, what they have done is that they have um, further limited Iran's economy because the IRGC is such a big part of uh, the Iranian uh, economy. I'm trying to move a bit quicker in the interest of time. So um, after the war, building on, after the Iran-Iraq war in 1988, the IRGC built on engineering and backup equipment uh, that it had acquired, as well as the financial and human capital that it had uh, gathered during the war to become the main contractor in developmental projects all across Iran in the post-war period. It established large corporations called bases, probably to comply with its military identity, that bid to take over state-sponsored projects and won the bids through a generous amount of extra-legal help. 
The IRGC's dominance over Iran's economy sector only increased over time since 1988. Um, today, it controls a major part of uh, the economy in fields as varied as energy, tourism, media, telecommunication, uh, and so on. And many of these businesses, the point is, require the IRGC to conduct foreign trade um, to import technology, expertise, goods, and raw material. So the various rounds of sanctions against uh, Iran, uh, uh, like targeting Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile programs, imposed either by the US or uh, the UN Security Council, significantly reduced oil sales and lowered the government's income that finances these endeavors, the IRGC's endeavors. And uh, by making business deals with IRGC-related companies illegal in 20, uh, 2007 and 2019, the terrorism-related sanctions by the U.S. further deterred international business partners um, and further limited IRGC's domestic gains, not the extraterritorial activities. There is a counter-argument here that sanctions have actually benefited the IRGC against what I'm uh, arguing. So. Uh, some have argued, myself included to be honest, that the IRGC is not only evading sanctions in general, especially those uh, that the JCPOA aim to remove, but also benefiting from them. That is because sanctions have enabled the IRGC businessmen and their political patrons to engage in even more corruption and extra-legal monetary gains in Iran. So because civilian entities such as Iran's national oil company face trouble selling oil through conventional channels, uh, for instance, powerful individuals uh, were more likely to, uh, to be tasked with deploying IRGC's informal uh, routes and connections through the region to export some oil, which is what Iran has been doing. Um, this is possibly the reason why many hardliners, including politicians and elite IRGC members, persistently oppose or even sabotage attempts to revive the JCPOA. But we have to have in mind that these... Um, Benefits are mostly likely to be personal and nepotistic, and, and not um, affecting the, not benefiting the IRGC as this uh, massive corporation at large. Uh, it still leaves the IRGC's gains from Iran's various domestic uh, markets in decline. Um, in addition, the terrorism-related sanctions, um, because of the um, legal punitive layer that they have added, make it even more difficult for these individuals to the, like make make their hands more tied uh, than before. So um, I'm not actually sure what what the individual gain is there. Um, it, maybe the general sanctions are benefiting them, but the terrorism-related sanctions, I think, should actually tie the hands of the individuals further as well. But now, under economic pressure more than ever, in 2021, Iran showed willingness again to renegotiate its nuclear program after Trump had pulled out. We know a round of negotiations happened. Uh, the IRGC's FTO lesson was a major point of uh, contention, as I mentioned. Um, at, towards the end of that round of negotiations. But just before that round kind of withered, both due to uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency's reports of Iran's increased nuclear activity, but also the start of the nationwide woman life freedom protests in Iran that kind of completely distracted the government from uh, the foreign policy into domestic unrest. Um, before that round um, sort of diminished, Iran actually changed its stance about the IRGC. It dropped the demand that it, the, the IRGC be delisted from the FTO, and instead asked that the limitations uh, be modified in a way that allows the IRGC to conduct civilian businesses inside Iran, in the domestic sphere. According to US officials, the latest draft of the agreement I think I have a code here, stipulated that Europeans and other non-Americans could conduct business with Iranian entities engaged in transactions with the IRGC without fear of triggering U.S. sanctions, provided that their primary business partner was not on a U.S. sanctions registry. So um, the, basically the domestic 
uh, effects, consequences of the FTO listing are removed. Uh, I mean, it didn't happen. It, it wasn't signed, but in the latest um, um, version of the agreement, that was the decision. That FTO listing remains in place, but its domestic consequences are um, um, sort of alleviated. So from all this, we can make the conclusion that although the limitations on the IRGC did not change its extraterritorial behavior significantly, uh, it did modify, um, as Iran's demands demonstrate, the terrorist, uh, uh, sorry, the um, um, uh, other aspects of Iran's foreign policy through the pressure that it put on Iran's economy. It forced Iran to negotiate its nuclear program for some economic relief. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the complications uh, regarding what lies ahead uh, before wrapping up. Okay. So to think about further developments, it is important to note that the indirect effect of the IRGC terrorist designations, uh, as I discussed, has not been openly declared by Western leaders as a reason for keeping the IRGC on the US FTO list. Um, so I'm not saying that the U.S. Or, or like other countries are pursuing the terrorist designation because they know they have this indirect effect. It might very well have been an unintended uh, consequence uh, that they are benefiting from. In fact, the complications that arise from such a designation has been a deterrent factor for uh, a lot of like Global North countries um, to follow uh, the U.S.'s footsteps and uh, call IRGC a terrorist organization because... The IRGC is an official military of the country in parallel with uh, the Iranian regular army. The U.S. Department of State's list, the FTO list, is mainly um, consisting of rebel groups, uh, like anti-government groups, with various levels of geopolitical ambition, from a sub-branch of the Colombian FARC and the Real Irish Resistance Army to Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, as well as state-sponsored semi-independent militias such as the Palestinian Hamas and the Lebanese Hezbollah. The IRGC, including its courts force, is different from all of these groups. And that list is long. I'm sure you, you have seen it at some point. Uh, it's not a small list. And the IRGC is an outlier uh, on that list because it has a permanently legal status in Iran. I am not saying that to justify any of the actions. That's just the Iranian constitution. Um, the Iranian constitution counts it as uh, an official armed wing of the state. And as a result of this formal status, the terrorist designation creates a host of legal and diplomatic issues that um, the EU and the UK have been trying to avoid. Just a final note about the current situation, the war on Gaza, uh, the activities of uh, like Hamas on October 7, the uh, continuing activities of the Houthis in the Red Sea. Does that change this equilibrium that we've been talking about? I don't think it changes it much because in that we have to keep Iran's, uh, the nature of Iran's relationship with these militias in mind. The um, sort of common narrative is that Iran has these like empire of proxies in the Middle East and sometimes beyond with full control over what they do and um, just like full political alliance with them, which is um, not really the case. They are not unshakable in their loyalty to Iran and they are not in a stable political relationship to Iran either. So, um, for one thing, not all of these proxies have similarly close ties to Iran. Hezbollah, for instance, has been the most consistent. I won't go into the history. Um, it was created in the image of the IRGC. It was created in a very like f f uh, um, uh, fertile ground where Iran actually had different so-called proxies in um, or different connections with different uh, militias on the ground in Lebanon. So Hezbollah was the closest to the government, the mainstream government. The other issue is that the relationship is not necessarily stable. Hamas is a perfect example of uh, like how they had a falling out basically uh, from with Iran over the Syrian civil war where Iran backed Bashar Assad while um, Hamas uh, backed the opposition. 
And the October 7 attack was an extreme example of where Hamas stands in terms of its loyalty to Iran. The attack happened exactly when Iran was making amends with uh, Saudi Arabia. And um, so the timing was really um, unfortunate for Iran. Um, and Iran was obviously also surprised by the attack. So they weren't uh, like included in the decision making or um, anything. And that makes, uh, leads me to the um, third aspect we should have in mind, and that is that these militias have found a life of their own independent of Iran, each to a certain extent. Even the most uh, loyal to Iran, like Hezbollah and Hashd Shabi, are like there's research that shows, uh, like a colleague of mine, Dr. Ina Rudolph, for instance, has done amazing research on uh, the Hashd's um, activities and shows how Iran is not really on their minds. They are like working within their domestic um, field and trying to just like make alliances and uh, balance each other out and um, uh, work against uh, US forces or sometimes cooperate with them. So um, we have to keep this complex and potted relationship between Iran and its proxies into account uh, when um, talking about Iran's influence and how sanctions have uh, affected them. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for this uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture and well-researched, well-argued, and I'm sure there will be quite um, some, uh, some questions about um, several topics you touch on. Um, uh, let me just uh, kickstart the, uh, the, the question part with, um, with uh, just a, a comment and probably a question. Uh, with the, the finding of your research actually join what um, global research about the sanctions, including counterterrorism sanctions, that uh, they actually do not work. Generally, they do not work. Um, in fact, um, many research have um, pointed to the fact that uh, they produce the adverse effect. And especially when um, US and Western uh, sanctions, um, they have in mind, they are put in mind with the assumption that these sanctions would isolate the nation state or groups and would lead ultimately uh, to, um, to some regime change. So this, this would be my question. You, you touch on the, the adverse effects uh, regarding the economic uh, aspect, saying that probably some personal uh, members of the, of the Revolutionary Guards that benefited from these sanctions. But uh, what about the political side? Did you um, see anything that, that um, uh, points to the fact that probably these sanctions have consolidated the power of the uh, Revolutionary Guards? That would be my questions, and I will start taking questions from the floor. Dr. Elias. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a round. We'll take a round. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. I have a question about the, sac the sanctions and their effect while having in mind the principal agent uh, framework. In the principal agent framework, we see uh, in the history of especially Egypt how the Mamalik, who were uh, basically agent, and they, became, uh, they took over uh, and became the principal. And so the way that you described the beginning of the uh, IRGC, there is a tendency for it to evolve into and capture the state. So did the sanctions slow this down? Did they uh, undermine this process, or did they uh, enhance it? Thank you. Dr. Harit Hassan. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I have a comment and a question or two. Uh, the first comment, uh, while I agree with you in uh, uh, undermining the argument that uh, the militias in the Middle East, Hezbollah, the Hajj al-Shaabi, the Houthis, are proxies of Iran, obviously they have their own agency and their independent interest, but also I I disagree with you, uh, with you saying that they are acting with Iran not in their mind. Uh, I think in, in a way they are uh, political and ideological partners in a transnational uh, network of solid solidarity with, uh, with, the, uh, like with Shiism uh, also being some kind of uh, transnational ideology that dictate their, this 
solidarity. Uh, I have two questions uh, re regarding sanctions. Uh, can you tell us something about how much sanctions affected Iranian oil industry and whether the IRGC has uh, also investments uh, or has managed to infiltrate the Iranian gas and oil industry? The second question, uh, you talked about the institutional buildup and uh, evolution of the IRGC, and you talked about the first generation, those who fought the war against uh, Iran, and obviously those are the ones who became the leaders of the IRGC, whether Soleimani or Ka'ani. But I wanted to know more about the new generation that is uh, emerging in the IRGC, and whether they have a different mindset, and and whether when the, the time will come and they will take over the RGC, you will have a different uh, organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harith. Um, question, another uh, question? First of all, I want to disagree with, with some of the terminology Hello, testing translation, testing translation, testing translation. Can you hear the translation? Can you, can you hear the translation? Testing, 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 one, two, three, testing, translation, testing, translation, testing, 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 testing. Can you hear me? Okay. Regarding uh, the proxies of Iran in the region, I would uh, want, like you to elaborate a little bit to what extent uh, these groups are linked to Iran. Is it based on interest or necessity or religion? There are some Sunni ones and Shi'i ones. The Palestinian resistance movements are Sunni, so they're not ideologically linked to Iran. They're linked with Iran for other reasons. Also, I, uh, on the business of sanctions, why did they have an impact on the economic uh, side and not the military side? Why do we see that Iran continuing to develop its military capabilities? Yet when you talked about the economic side, you said there was an impact. And also the sanctions did not have an impact on Iran's foreign policy. So therefore, in conclusion, why insisting on the sanctions and creating more f friction in the region? Okay, uh, Jama Yusuf uh, from the Arab Center. Uh, thank you for the talk. That was great. Uh, two questions. First, why do, do these sanctions don't work? Do we know why they don't work? And uh, do, do they work in specific sectors? and fail to work in, in others. Uh, the other thing I would like to ask is, how would you compare uh, sanctions not working in Iran to sanctions not working in Russia? Are they using the same uh, techniques uh, to evade from uh, sanctions uh, affecting their economies? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll stop here, and we'll take probably another round. Thank you. Can go. Thank you very much. These are all great questions. Um, so um, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Albastri, and, and uh, it actually relates to the uh, very last question as well, that yes, there is a lot of research that shows sanctions are just not the most effective um, political weapon, so to speak, um, uh, generally speaking. Have they um, led to like the, the consolidation of power in the hands of the hardliners, as again, sorry, global research um, um, stipulates and uh, demonstrates, 
it has in Iran as well. So uh, it has, um, there are, I think, two sides to it. On the one hand, um, the global north's pressuring a, like a um, government to be anti-imperial in its ideology and having like propagated that ideology for 45 years now is actually a boost uh, in um, like ideological boost. So uh, the, rel the uh, narrative that they are um, um, producing and the, the straw man enemy that they are creating out of the US specifically, but um, the West uh, uh, more generally finds some uh, backing in reality. See, they are, they are like choking our economy out of animosity. Um, of course, they don't mention the, uh, the um, sort of um, a, a tensions that Iran is uh, initiating in the region as the uh, trigger factor. So on that front, it um, um, strengthens the hardliner ideology and um, for their loyal audience gives them um, like more uh, support. On the other hand, the Iranian population who are like in opposition to the government from like on a uh, spectrum sees the effect of sanctions on the uh, on their daily lives, which is very very tangible. In fact, I should have uh, um, brought that up too. The Iranian middle class is disappearing, basically, as we speak. Um, they see it from the eyes of uh, the government. They see it as the government's inefficiency, the unwillingness to have an open uh, relationship with the world, to have like open trade and allow them to just like connect um, uh, to the international community and have quote unquote normal lives. Um, so it creates a level of uh, apathy in um, the population as well. As I, I think you mentioned that um, one of the um, intentions behind like uh, suffocating a country economically is that the, there will be a popular uprising and uh, that will lead to regime change. That is very, a very inhumane um, take that um, like the US government has uh, pursued. It's basically giving the civilian population no choice but to go on the streets and risk their lives. Um, and that has not happened in Iran, even though something else triggered a massive, the largest um, social movement in Iran just last year, in the past couple of years. Um, regime change does not come along so easily in an authoritarian, repressive government. Um, so that has not happened, and it has actually consolidated uh, power in that sense. Um, the principal agent framework and how to see IRGC in that um, uh, sort of, with that lens, I don't think the IRGC has ever um, intended, it's an organization, we can't uh, uh, ascribe motivations to it, but the general consensus within the IRGC and the perception of it uh, has never been that of uh, uh, taking over the regime, at least formally. Um, their existence is very much tied to the supreme leaders and his support. So even though there has been um, leaks about the uh, fissures and the splits within the IRGC, especially over the past couple of years, um, still the, I believe, minority who are still very loyal to the supreme leader and have the most radical political views are uh, in charge, and as long as the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei is there, that will be the case, I believe. Um, as to why that is the case, I don't have the sharpest answer, I'm afraid. Yes, the IRGC does have the power to take over, but is it their, in their interest to do so? A lot of the um, they their raison d'etre is the ideology, the ideology of the Islamic Republic. So uh, if they um, take over, it's like they're giving up that ideological raison d'etre and 
becoming this like corporate neoliberal business that uh, will be running the country. I actually think that might be a possible future, not by a coup or a takeover, but by the like the natural passing of the supreme leader. Depending on who the replacement will be, the IRGC might have a more uh, strong, a stronger like direct uh, uh, role, or just like actually a um, takeover, and there will we they lead to some like um, metamorphosis of uh, the government in that sense, and a kind of like gradual letting go of the ideological hardline. Um, sort of uh, core in, in, the, uh, in favor of a neoliberal economy, basically. Um, to your comment about proxies and how, uh, uh, to what extent actually they have um, 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 their own, uh, they, they've grown uh, uh, like uh, apart from Iran and independent from Iran, which um, also addresses the gentleman's um, uh, question about um, like what is the nature of these relationships. I agree with you that yes, there is an ideological side to it, but as you were mentioning, there's, um, there's not a clear ideological line that necessarily connects all of these entities together. As I mentioned, it is stronger in the case of first Hezbollah and on a second degree Hashd Shabi, but then the Sunni Hamas, for instance, the uh, 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 Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, they, or even the Houthis, Zaydis, do not like perfectly align with the Islamic Republic ideology. I'm, I'm pretty sure if like a Zaydi cleric were to um, uh, like propose, I don't know, opposition changes or anything within Iran, they would be suppressed uh, very heavily and uh, immediately. So. Although there is like the ideological base there, it is very interest driven at the same time. And uh, the ups and downs in the relationships also demonstrate that. I would say perhaps the only case that we could say that the ideological uh, link has stayed strong is Hezbollah. And yeah, the, they, they created Hezbollah, they, whereas like they didn't create Hamas, for instance, and uh, it's, it's um, um, cohesive, it's uh, kind of centralized as much as the IRGC is, and they have been able to keep that control as long as uh, Nasrallah is uh, just in line with the Iran Supreme Leader's uh, ideology. Uh, but the others are too scattered and too uh, basically have different agendas um, in that. Um, so the question about sanctions on Iran's oil industry and uh, the IRGC's role in the gas and oil, I do not have direct number, numbers. Um, the sanctions did definitely like uh, significantly reduce Iran's oil sale. Over time, they found uh, uh, like ways, indirect, untransparent ways to sell some oil. It increased a little bit, but I believe it still stands at somewhere around 20% of what it was before um, 2018, before JCPOA was basically um, uh, rendered ineffective. Um, so it's still very low. At, but yeah, I have to go back and check the numbers. I'm, I'm afraid uh, I'm not 100% positive. The institutional history and how um, the new generation has uh, come out of it, there is a great book uh, by uh, a good colleague of mine, Dr. Nargis Bajokli, on, um, it's called Iran Reframe. You have, uh, anxiety is the power. Anxiety is power. Uh, yes, anxiety of, uh, of power in Iran. It's a great explanation of how at least a group of uh, the second, the, well, third or fourth generation, the current generation of IRGC and Basij members have actually grown a bit more radical because, like, her argument is that because they haven't seen the practicalities um, and the necess necessity of pragmatism during the war, they have these, like, utopian uh, radical ideas and want to pursue them, whereas the older generation is looking for ways to connect to the rest of the society that is growing distance from them, uh, distant from them. Uh, the 
young generation is like all about sticking to um, values, hardcore. Um, I haven't done research myself on the newer generations. I like intentionally uh, sought to interview uh, the first generation and the commanders, um, as you mentioned. Um, how much more time do I? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Five minutes is great. So I try to explain a little bit why um, the sanctions haven't worked on the military side, and by that I mean the extraterritorial side. It's a great question uh, um, because uh, I have to mention that yes, the finances have been tighter. Uh, Iran has not been able to provide as much support to these uh, proxies as before. Again, because of the informal, uh, extra-legal nature of it, it's hard to have um, reliable, reliable and comprehensive data. But from the indications, we know that uh, it's been tighter. What hasn't been affected is the mechanisms through which the, the money is, um, um, the like financial transactions happen, the export of um, military equipment and uh, like manpower happens. Those uh, we see that have not been significantly affected uh, because they were not uh, transparent mechanisms to be monitored and uh, uh, um, intercepted anyway. Um, I, I honestly don't have a lot more to say uh, on top of the talk itself of why the sanctions haven't worked. I, I think the reason is, at least part of the reason, is the institutionalization of these like informal networks within the IRGC that allow extra-legal activities uh, internationally. Um, and as um, into, uh, like, if they have worked in specific sectors and not others, they have affected the more transparent side of the IRGC's operations, which is which mainly relates to their domestic businesses and not extraterritorial. I'm having trouble reading my handwriting for the last question. Yeah, it doesn't not work. Oh, in Russia, yes, I, I think I addressed it at the beginning about what like are, are are these the same mechanisms that sanctions don't work in Russia. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take another question. Dr. Fadi Zarakat. Thank you. Um, so you alluded to the fact that uh, some groups or individuals have an interest to sabotage uh, lifting the sanctions. And this also um, takes me into a, the question where the sanctions created an economy of sanctions, where you have lots of third parties, even uh, big corporations, starting third parties to mediate uh, the economy transactions between them. And these third parties are interested in the sanctions staying. And we see them in Europe, we see them in the Gulf, we see them in Lebanon. Uh, and it's not uh, maybe a coincidence, like after the financial collapse in Lebanon, that these are actually now becoming, there is no bank sector, banking sector anymore, cash is the modality. So I didn't see, like, you alluded to that in, in at least two sentences. Can you explain more of that if you have any appreciated? That would be the last question. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, you're absolutely right. I only alluded to just, like, individuals benefiting from this while there has been um, um, sort of a business and economy, as you put it, uh, around it. Uh, just recently, I heard the worrying news that the bank I uh, have an account with in the UK is uh, just closing down an account um, of like a, um, a petrochemical or I, I don't remember what, what kind of a, a corporation that had an account with them because they realize it's actually a um, sort of a facade for the Iranian petrochemical industry uh, that, that basically um, like established this uh, uh, allegedly individual um, um, uh, corporate business um, uh, and opened a, an account with them. And I am worried because my personal accounts have been closed before without my knowledge in the US, not in the UK. And I read that news and I was like, oh no, <laughs> it's going to happen again. <laughs> now they're going to close all, uh, all Iranians' accounts. Um, so 
Yes, that that has happened, but I think that still doesn't make up for the damage that it is doing to the IRGC's businesses within Iran, um, like just in a um, um, simple balancing. It would still be beneficial for the uh, IRGC as a whole and for the Iranian government um, to just like lift some of the limitations. But the smaller number of people and uh, organizations that are um, involved in this um, um, economy of sanctions will always be uh, the oppositional voice in this regard. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, excellent lecture and uh, for the excellent questions as well. And uh, for me, there would be like two uh, takeaways. The, the first one is um, the sanctions hardly work, actually. They fail most of the time, their stated goals. And the second takeaway is that regime change through sanctions does not come along easily in an author authoritarian regime. So thank you so much. Thank you for, uh, for your presence, for your interaction. And uh, thanks to the Iranian Studies Unit for organizing this and for the Arab Center for hosting it. Thank you. Thank you for having me.